everybody and uh, welcome to the 12th episode of the Surge podcast. My name is Saud Al Zaid and right off the bat I'd like to thank everybody for a phenomenal response uh, over the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, so today I'll be talking about what will actually end up being a two-parter I think because it's a, it's a bit of a lot to get through. Um, namely because it's one of those things that hasn't been very well studied, I think. And it's um, it's a subject that I got DM'd about on Instagram uh, regarding how to manage difficult codes. Uh, and uh, the person who uh, was asking the question had given me a very uh, detailed set of examples of codes where they'd felt and they'd use the correct term, chaos, was occurring around them. And um, that reminded me of a talk that I'd given a couple of years back at the Canadian Association of Critical Care Nurses about equilibrium and chaos. And I'll be honest, I, I give different variations of this type of thing, where I'm talking about human factors and resuscitation. And in general, uh, the nurses seem to come to these things more than the doctors do, whether it's at a surgical conference, anesthesia conference, uh, emergency conference. It, the subject doesn't seem to have the same uh, traction uh, with doctors as it does with nurses. So uh, in terms of disclosures, um, you know, pretty much my full-time practice these days is uh, acute care. So uh, there, there isn't that much I'm going to be talking about today that isn't relevant in acute care. So if you don't work in an emergency room or if you don't have access to it, and you don't work as part of a code team, this might be a little bit boring. Uh, today I'll be talking about the nature of the game, and if I have enough time, I'll give some task-specific training points, and then uh, maybe talk a little bit about a ritual integration. I'll probably end up doing two parts. I'm not sure yet, because there's a lot to get through, and um, there's a bit of context to, to understand where the problem lies. So um, let's begin with something nice and simple. Let's try and define what we mean by chaos. <clears throat> I mean, we've all worked in an emergency room and we've all seen chaos happening, but how do you really define it? Is it the unexpected airway or is it the guy who comes in with a premade thoracotomy? Or is it um, that injury that you just can't stop staring at? You know, that thing that you didn't expect to come in because you were coming in to just round and, you know, it'd be an easy day. And then this shows up in front of you. I would argue that, you know, if, if these are your patients uh, and if you work in a place like this every day with about six to eight devices required to keep a patient going, by definition, your job is chaos. And I don't care if you're the nurse there, if you're the janitor there, if you're the PAB there, if you're the physician's assistant there, if you're the doctor there, if you're the chief of clinical services, if you're the medical engineer, if you're the uh, pharmacist, if you're the physiotherapist. Everybody involved in a hospital that has acute care as part of its central goal will experience chaos during their time at that hospital. By definition, it's part and parcel of the game for us. And note that I don't mean this. I don't mean a perfectly communicated, well-coordinated code. Many of these perfect quote-unquote codes are either simulations or what I call pre-codes. They're patients who have deranged physiology, certainly, and who do require time-sensitive care. But we have about an hour or the golden hour to get things sorted, as opposed to five minutes. When you have five minutes to do something that would typically take you an hour, this tends to happen. And that's what we're talking about today. It, we're talking about when things happen in real life that aren't quite as slick as you'd imagine them or you would like them and the stress that that involves. Why do these things happen though? Why do we have this picture happening time and time again in the emergency room? It doesn't happen very often, thankfully, but it happens at least, I would say, between 1 and 5% of the time in good to bad centers. And the outcomes are great. The patients do fine. Despite what it looks like, the patients actually do fine in most cases. But why does that happen? Why do we have bad codes? I mean, let's be honest. For the most part, the people that you work with are extremely qualified. They're extremely intelligent people. 
if you got through anything to do with health sciences, you've sacrificed quite a bit. And, you know, you, you're pretty smart, okay? You're pretty bright. We've all done ATLS, ACLS, or the equivalent, like TNCC. And we've all done simulations. We all spent some time doing simulations. It's the way that we're tested, right? We're tested on virtual patients. We're tested on simulated patients. We're tested on CPR dummies. That's the way that we were trained. And we all have some experience. I mean, typically uh, high flow trauma centers, let's say, just because I have trauma on the brain these days after a year and a half of it. High flow trauma centers tend to have an extremely, extremely high number of activations where the whole team comes down. And, you know, it's a coordinated effort between three or four different services. When I say extreme number, I mean like a thousand, right, at minimum. So if you have a thousand activations a year, you're doing this a thousand times a year, you're rotating on that service for two to three months, you're going to do this at least a hundred times, right? You do this a hundred times, you're going to get good. So why does it happen? Well, that question was posed way back in 2012, about eight years ago now, by a, a task team that analyzed Code Blue. So they analyzed anything involving an arrest or a code. So uh, whether it was in the emergency room, in the OR, in the labor room, it didn't matter, across multiple institutions. And it was a very um, sort of down-to-earth study. They, they just basically interviewed doctors and they interviewed nurses. And when they asked nurses what was the number one reason why codes were run poorly, they almost always said that it was poor communication. And that the doctor assumed that they knew what was going on and didn't really know the context of the situation. When they were asked what their source of anxiety was, they also said that they didn't know who to listen to and who was, in fact, the person who was running the show or the leader of the code. And they had genuinely felt that they didn't know what was going on, that there was a lack of, of communicated knowledge. And when they were asked how to improve the Code Blue team in their hospital, and this isn't like one center. This is Canada-wide, right? This is a whole country. It's a country with fairly good health care. The answer was crowd control, improve communication, more training sessions. When they asked the doctors the same question, they got the exact same answers. Unclear leadership, poor delegation, concern over errors due to lack of communication, concern over a what-if scenario that the patient doesn't do well. And they all cite the same thing, crowd control and improvement of communication. So it's clear that our problem isn't the knowledge base. It's not that we need extra certification. Our problem stems from communication. And there are two reasons why that happens, or multiple reasons, really, but two basic roots of, of these issues. And, you know, the results of it are, you need to ask yourself a question. How do we get the message across? How do we stay on the same page? And how do we avoid medical errors? And who is responsible when this does happen? How does that end up manifesting? I'll be honest, that was a typo, that last one. Let's look at your typical code team on paper. So your typical code team includes a team leader, a recorder, a runner, an airway officer, either an anesthetist or RT, a bedside uh, resuscitation nurse. Usually that person is an extremely good IV access person. When I say extremely good, I mean like level five ninja good, right? And a pharmacist. Now, uh, those of you who work in the Middle East know that pharmacists are very rare clinical pharmacists. We have a lot of trouble uh, recruiting them and training them, mainly due to funding issues. The funding is reappropriated for things that we may not necessarily feel strongly help us out in the bigger scheme of running a service. But I, I have a firm belief, and the data supports it now, but when I first wrote the slide, I had a firm belief that pharmacists were required because it's intuitive. If you have somebody who knows how to mix the drug better than you do, can prepare the drug for your nurse to give, and knows when you need the drug and what it interacts with, and also knows more toxicology than you do, which is something that we've all weak at, no matter what your background is, whether you label yourself as an emergency resuscitationist, 
an anesthesia resuscitationist, a critical care resuscitationist, a surgeon intensivist resuscitationist, a trauma surgeon. I don't care what you call yourself. We're all bad at talks, right? And these guys are very good at talks because it's literally part of their science, right? And this is what the team looks like. They look like a well-oiled machine that's in focus, right? And they know what they want to do and they're prioritizing it so that a tire change or four tires changed rather can happen within less than five minutes, typically about one minute 30, maybe two minutes on average in the higher level, elite level NASCAR teams, right? If you think about it, typical human beings like you and me, well, me, I don't know about you, 45 minutes to change a tire. And I'm dying by the end of it. It's like the worst workout I've ever had. These guys, minute and a half. And the reason is communication. Things are chaotic around them, but they can communicate. That's what our team should look like. Unfortunately, we have the innocent bystanders, the peanut gallery. Peanut gallery is typically a group of people who want to help. They have extremely good intentions. The problem is, because they want to help, they end up interrupting you and stopping you from doing what you prioritize. They might state things that are obvious. They might stop you from doing the right thing. They might be family members. And to be honest with you, sometimes they're very senior members of staff who just have a different area of expertise and feel for the patient. It comes from a good place. But the peanut gallery, combined with our elite level Daytona Racing track team, end up producing this, a mosh pit. And that's what chaos looks like. And Lord help me, I've seen it with the best of the best. It doesn't matter. And I've been through it myself. Which is why I feel very strongly that rather than trying to avoid chaos in the trauma bay or in the resuscitation room or during a code, we should prepare for it. And the way that you prepare for it is to have crowd control as part of your plan. And yes, that does include calling in security guards if you need them. I will repeat. The clinical aspect of our training emphasizes the need to have an organized team. But the practical aspect of our training means that we need to learn how to control the crowd around us. There are two parts to that control. The first is to bring in a security team to help you get people out of the room. The second is to mandate a need for the trauma team leader to direct the flow of communication. Now, when, just very briefly, when you're looking at tools that are required right off the bat, and I mean this, required, required as much as the requirement of being able to intubate if you're an anesthetist. That's how seriously I take this. The tools that are required for you to be able to communicate and chaotic situations include the following. First, defining the rules. Secondly, ignoring everybody outside the team. Thirdly, verbalizing your thought process as the TTL. People need to know what you're thinking. Fourth, minimum words, maximum impact. Pretty much the opposite of this episode. Minimum words, maximum impact. Five, graded assertiveness. Now, you can be a nice person, but you have to be assertive. And if that means that you have to be aggressive, so be it. Because it's a patient's life that's at stake. Close the loop in terms of communication. Say something and expect a response. You don't get the response, make sure that they actually tell you what you told them. And then activate it and tell you when it's done. And then advocate when something's missing. And this is a two-way street. Advocacy, two-way street. We're going to go through each one in a bit more detail. So... Minimum words, maximum impact. What that means is you state the problem. You don't hint at it. You shouldn't be saying something along the lines of, I think we need to intubate. Or, should we give him some blood? He's still hypotensive. I know it looks like it's a drug overdose, but I don't know. The fast looked positive to me. It should be something along the lines of, patient's GCS is low. We need to intubate. I know that there's an element of toxicology but I've ordered a blood gas and the fast is positive. So I think given the patient's vitals, an ABC score that high would require that we have blood in the room. Do you mind if I go and get it? You say things like this, things go well. 
Now, minimum words and maximum impact also counts for when you're confused as the trauma team leader. If you're genuinely confused as to whether or not to intubate, asking your airway person a direct question of how they feel about the airway might be a good idea. And the question could be something along the lines of, I'm very concerned about this patient's airway, but I don't know if we should intubate because the GCS is fluctuating. From your end, can you see if the patient requires intubation or not? The person might see that their saturation is low. They might see some other finding that you can't see from the edge of the bed that could help you make the decision. And their input as experienced people with the airway will go a long way. But what you shouldn't do is not express a doubt during a code. It's an all-in scenario. You're going for maximum impact here. The definition of maximum impact. Now, graded assertiveness. So this was one of the hardest things I had to learn. Because I think I started off very timid, then I went overboard, and then I sort of had to rein myself back. And, you know, the culture where I work in right now, it's not normal to have assertiveness. People expect uh, proficiency to equate to being quiet, as opposed to proficiency equating to metrics and outcomes. So it's a bit different. And one of the best approaches I found uh, growing up was the PACE approach, which is to probe alert, challenge, and invoke an emergency. So what I mean by probe is, let's just say hypothetical scenario, you're a nurse and you can't get the vein. And the R2 keeps checking the GCS and he's taking too long to check the GCS because he doesn't know what he's doing. So you probe, you can actually ask the R2, do you know that I can't get a vein? And see if they're willing to be receptive enough to get out of the way knowing full well and good that this patient might require some drugs for intubation given through that IV cannula. Then you alert them. Can we reassess the situation? I really can't see you getting a GCS here because you don't know the GCS because you're an R2. Maybe I should work on some IV access right now. Or we really have no IV access and I really do think it's a priority. Then challenge them. Please stop looking at the GCS while I need to get a needle in. And then once it's an emergency, lose it. Stop what you're doing and let me put that goddamn IV in. Now, if you've worked with me, whether you're a nurse, a trainee, or a medical student, you know. You can scream at me from the top of your lungs during a code. I'd be totally okay with it. 100% of the time. Because that's the nature of the game. Now, other people might not be okay with it, but at least your patient outcomes are good. So every now and then, you do have to assert yourself, and we've all been there before. It's an unfortunate thing, but it has to happen. Graded assertiveness works, and there's good data behind it. Next, closed-loop communication. So in closed-loop communication, the sender communicates a message, the receiver interprets the message, the sender confirms the intended message is received, and then the receiver reports back once the task is done. So an example would be, John, Massive blood transfusion, level one prime, please. Coming from a TTL. John, who's one of the best nurses that we have, would say, okay, Mike, I'm going to activate the massive transfusion protocol and prime the level one. To which the TTL, Mike, would say, that's great, thanks, John. And subsequently, the receiver or the nurse would say, Mike, level one is primed, blood is on the way. Communication of that nature is perfect. The problem is trying to force it on somebody. So I tend to be very annoying when I'm trying to do this because I'll ask the same question over and over and over again. I'll give the same order over and over and over again until somebody says, okay, I'll do it. And then I give them a time limit to do it. And most people don't appreciate that in time sensitive situations. They only appreciate it after the fact, but it is what you have to do. Next part is a bit more, um, difficult because it's about uh, being the non-TTL members of the team. So every now and then you'll have a TTL who has some tunnel vision. I've been guilty of that myself, unfortunately. When you have tunnel vision, you fixate on one problem that you know that you have to treat as a priority. And so other problems tend to concern you less and changes in those other factors aren't picked up in your brain. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way that your brain is designed, right? And when that does happen, it's not great, all right? I agree with you. It's, it's a bit unfortunate. But it's the team's job 
to refocus the TTL, to get rid of the tunnel vision. And the trauma team leader and the team working together on that, checking each other's problems, checking each other's errors, I think is uh, like a higher level of, of team dynamics. And I'll probably talk about that uh, in the next episode, but that's like a higher level thing, right? And I'm very impressed when I do see it. So the five steps to advocacy that, that uh, I've trained people on are, number one, attention getter. So you stop the person, you say, excuse me, something's going on. You state the concern. You state the problem as you see it, and then you offer a solution. Because your TTL is not recognizing that problem until now. And to ask them to stop the train of thought during a high-intensity resuscitation and to think about something that they didn't even pick up on is just too much. It's too much cognitive load. So it's usually better, quote-unquote better, if you have a solution that you know you have in mind because you're an expert now, right? You've been doing this all week or a month or all year. And then you obtain an agreement by asking if that plan sounds good to them. Usually the TTL will agree with your plan and will refocus afterwards and you'll get far better outcomes that way. So an example would be, I have a 27-year-old MVC and um, the patient's hypotensive, right? Exactly the same as on the slide set. A good way of getting this message across would be uh, speaking to your TTL and saying, excuse me, John, um, the 23-year-old, or 27-year-old rather, MVC, is hypotensive right now, uh, his fast is positive. Uh, I think that we need to call the surgeons in and maybe start some blood. Also, uh, I'd put in two IVs. I think that we also need some central access as well. Let's activate the trauma team. The TTL would routinely say yes to that. And you'd get the trauma team activated, get ICU down, get the rest of the team down, and that's how you get the flow going when there's a bit of tunnel vision, right? So just to go a little bit deeper into higher levels of of communication, when you talk to people who who work with uh, trauma team dynamics regularly, and I keep mentioning trauma not just because I have trauma on the brain, but also because of the fact that a lot of the literature is from trauma. A lot of the more, more recent literature has been focused around trauma team training because of the acuteness of it and the standardization of it. It's, it's very easy to maximize communication and cognitive load training in, in those scenarios. So, you know, in communication master classes, there's a little bit more than just tools like the ones that we talked about. Uh, there's also understanding the difference between behaviors and thought processes and then syncing them up. So for trauma team leaders, the thought processes or the to-do list at any given quote-unquote activation or, or code trauma would be to orient themselves, to understand the situation, and to uh, see the perceived problem set. Then to assess the patient's priorities, assess the resources of the team and what you can get done comfortably in the trauma room, monitor the workload of the individuals and intervene when you have to, adhere to uh, the rules of the game and make sure that everybody else is and make sure that they listen to your instructions, check for potential errors, and then reassess, summarize, and readdress the above. This is what's happening in your brain, right? Now, there are parts of it that you need to communicate for your team to get to those goals. So you need to assign the roles and then verbally confirm them. And that's part of the behavior. You need to announce your understanding and priorities to the room. You need to delegate the tasks, not necessarily do them yourself. You don't need to put them in the chest tube. But you need to delegate putting the chest tube to a specific individual with a preset time limit. And if you need to take over a task like intubation, for example, you need to be able to hand over the leadership role comfortably while giving instructions for the leader who's going to take over. If this, then that type of situation. You need to voice your findings and avoid uh, diagnostic errors and reduce your fixation on specific things. And then you need to double check crucial data and verbalize the summary to the room. Now, your team has the same set of problems. Their thought process is to understand their roles and define them, to address any concerns that they have with the leader, to analyze the instructions, validate them, usually through closed loop instruction uh, set and communication, and then proceed. 
If something seems strange, flag it and point it out. Clear your mind of everything outside of the task at hand. You shouldn't be thinking about rounding up on the ward. You shouldn't be thinking about whether or whose case it is. You shouldn't be thinking about why you didn't get the chest tube. Because you ended up doing the fast, you have to make sure that the fast is done in a time-sensitive manner. And you should ignore the peanut gallery. Ignore everybody, no matter how senior they are, if they're not the trauma team leader. I can't emphasize this enough. If you involve more people from the peanut gallery in your decision-making process in a time-sensitive resuscitation, your outcomes might be good, but your stress levels will be so high, you'll be burned out by the end of the year. And that's the truth. I'm not talking about patient outcomes. I'm talking about your outcomes as a person as well. Both of them should be a priority if you're going to be in this business. Now, your behavior. You should never ask about a diagnosis. You should confirm using closed loop. You should voice your findings and talk to the people in the room. And by the room, I mean your team. You should review the information and avoid confusion. And you should double check all relevant data. A good way of doing this is to use the SMART step back tool, where you describe the situation, the management, the activity, the rapidity, troubleshoot, and then you ask people to talk to you. So an example of a team leader applying this tool would be 27-year-old motorbike accident who's just come in, guys. I need to activate the trauma team. I need a person at the airway to assess for possible intubation, given that the GCS looks slow from my end. I need a person to auscultate and do a fast ultrasound. I need the cardiac monitor on and two large bore IVs. I should hear about your primary survey within the next five minutes. If you have any concerns regarding the patient's blood pressure, which should be above a systolic of 110, heart rate, which should be below 110, saturation, which I need above 90, or GCS, which should be above 8, or the patient's ability to protect the airway, please talk to me and voice your concern. Thank you. Let's get started. When you say something like that in a clearly defined fashion, the ability of your team to follow the task goes up exponentially. And this has been studied. And I've referenced the article, but I think that everybody should read it. It's called The Impact of Brief Team Communication, Leadership, and Team Behavior Training on Ad Hoc Team Performance in the Trauma Care Setting. So I'll be referencing that article a second time in part two. But what the article basically says is, you should be able to effectively train your team using communication as a priority. It should be just as much a priority as clinical things that we teach our teams, like how to intubate and how to put in a central line. And that these things lead to better outcomes effectively, and that it, it doesn't take that much effort. That's what, that's what the two-liner on the article is. So in summary, by definition, I don't care what label you wear, but by definition, if you're working in acute care, your business is chaos. Don't try and avoid it. Try and accept it and work through it. Try and manage it. That's how you achieve equilibrium. Know the basic level tool sets, such as closed loop communication. Learn to be a good leader and a good follower. And remember which parts of your thought process need to manifest as behaviors. Your behaviors are what communicate with the outside world. Without them, people won't know what you're going through. Next episode, we'll talk about a framework for addressing this problem and how to teach it. Thank you for listening, and please subscribe either through YouTube, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or Instagram.